Turn with me, if you will, this morning to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, as we continue our study through Paul's epistle to this first church in Europe. Sometimes we think to ourselves that we would like to have a New Testament church. And when you say that, you might stop and think for a second, maybe we should be careful what we ask for, because the thought that a New Testament church was without problems is not correct. There were problems in New Testament churches. Listen to some of the problems Paul had in various places. When he wrote 1 Corinthians, he says, For I am informed, or have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Literally, the word is schisms. There are schisms among you. Now, I mean by this, that each one of you is saying, I of Paul, I am of Paul, I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So at the church at Philippians, there were factions where they really didn't get along with each other, and they had their favorite teacher, and each one lined up behind him. Then, if you read in 2 Corinthians, that not only was not the only problem, but in 2 Corinthians 10.10, Paul records what they said about him. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence or appearance is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. They said, you know, the Apostle Paul, his presence is, what does it say here, is unimpressive and his speech is contemptible. So the home team wasn't even on his side sometimes. And then in the book of Philippians, behind the scenes, I think there's problems in Philippians that he's trying to deal with. In Philippians 1.17, he says, There are some who proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So there were some people out there that were trying to cause him distress by preaching the gospel so there were problems there in the church. And then in chapter 3, he says, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evildoers or workers, beware of the false circumcision. So there were also false teachings going around. So there were false teachings. There were brethren that sought to cause him problems. There were people at Corinth who criticized his appearance and, and, and said his speech was contemptible. And then at the end of the book, chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says in Philippians, I urge you, Odia and Syntyche, to live in harmony in the Lord. And we read on and we'll get there, but these were two women in the church that apparently had an ongoing battle with one another and they couldn't get along. So if you say, we want a New Testament church, I'd say, well, I, I agree, we want a New Testament church, but don't fool yourself or kid yourself in thinking that the New Testament churches were perfect. There were problems in the churches there, and so sometimes in his letters he writes to correct some of those problems. And I believe today that's what he's doing in chapter 2, that he's writing to the church in Philippi. Now if you want to think about it, a big word for chapter 1, think about the word Christ. He says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So that's the big word in chapter 1, Christ. But in chapter 2, I think the big word is one another. I guess that's two words, but it's chapter 2, so maybe it'll work. In other words, one another or others. So chapter 1, Christ, but chapter 2, others, and he's encouraging them to get along with one another. Now chapter 1, there's this idea of confidence. Verse 6, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. He was confident that God would do a work in them to bring them to glory. And he's also confident that God was doing a work in the world, that even his circumstances and imprisonment had turned out for the progress of the gospel. And he said he was going to be released for the progress of their faith and joy. So he's a very confident person in Christ. And now in chapter 2, I think he's dealing a little bit more now with some of the problems at Philippi where he's saying, I want you to be united. Now at the end of chapter 1, he says he wants them to have one mind. And he wants to have one mind in there to strive for the gospel. And again, I think that carries over into chapter 2. In other words, he says, I want you to be united in Christ and striving for the gospel. And if you're striving for the gospel, if you're striving to proclaim Christ, win people to Christ, then some of these other problems won't be such a big deal. Yeah. 
And so I think that's where he's headed. Let's look in chapter 2 in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ. Now these are figures of speech because there's no other place where there's more encouragement. In other words, Christ is the most encouraging person and reality that there's ever been. And so he says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship or koinonia or communion in the spirit, if any affection and compassion. In other words, he's saying, if there's any of this, well, the truth is, this, this is these are the things that overflow in Christ. But if there's any of this, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. And that's what he said back up in 127. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether, whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In other words, he's saying, you have a great cause. You have a great Savior, and that's your mission is to proclaim him and to glorify him and to live for him. And some of these other things where, you know, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, it's, it's secondary, it's, it's irrelevant. Or Euodia and Syntyche, what are they fighting about, you know? Who's going to do the centerpieces at the women's banquet? I mean, who knows what they're fighting about, but probably not that important. He says, focus on the great cause that you have. And that's what we've been trying to see. And I hope you see that in the Bible, that I think the world tries to present the Christian as someone who's kind of out of touch with what's really going on in life, where that's just the opposite of the case, because the world is involved in things that are oftentimes not very important, really, in the big scheme of things. You and I can be involved in things of eternal importance. The church of Jesus Christ, the pillar and support of the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of life. He said those are things to be excited about and to be involved in and to strive together for the faith of the gospel, to be united in that. So make my joy complete. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, and literally that intent on one purpose is intent or thinking with one mind. And that's really the word that's used in this chapter here, at least in this paragraph, is having this one mind. And then he'll say having this submissive mind. And then he'll say having the mind of Christ. That's what he wants them to have. Now, there's a truth that the church is a unity and it's united by its founding, by its creation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, the apostle writes, For with one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So by the baptism with the spirit that every Christian has. Remember Romans 8, 9 says, If you have not the spirit of Christ, you are none of his. But if you have uh, Christ, then you have his spirit. So every Christian has the spirit, and the spirit has come into the Christian, we're all made to drink of one spirit, so we're all part of one body. There's a reality, there's a spiritual unity there that exists. But sometimes, though, it doesn't always work itself out. And so Jesus challenges people. He says in John chapter 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have also loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So he's saying there's a reality that you are one, but you need to show that you're one. And then also in John chapter 17, he prays, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. He wants a unity in the church. Now, the unity is not uniformity, and I don't think we want uniformity. We are all individuals, and God has made us that way, and that's good. Because if everybody's like me, then there's only a limited number of people you're going to interact with and will like you. <laughs> so we need to have a lot more 
And if everybody's like you, you only have a few limited numbers, but if we have a diversity, then we can all go out and have friends and contacts and people who are attracted to us. So we don't need to be uniform, but we do need to be united. And I think that's what he says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. And he says, united in purpose or one in mind. Now he goes on in verse 3 to develop that a little bit further. He says, not only having a similar or same mind, but to have a humble mind. Look in verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Now that seems to be the enemy of unity. In other words, verses 1 and 2, it's the imperative, what does he want you to do? To be of the same mind. And he says, now be careful because don't do things from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. And that's the big word here in this paragraph, humility of mind. With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Now the Apostle Paul frequently uses verses, as Warren Wiersbe likes to call them, the one another verses. In Romans 12, 10, he says, be devoted to one another. He says, give preference to one another. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, encourage one another. Build up one another. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens. So we could say, in a church, we could say in a marriage, we could say uh, in a family, we could say even in a workplace, we could say in a country that if any organization is really going to prosper, then these are the attitudes that really are the blessing and the foundation for these kind of successful organizations. And what does he say here? Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do you think if we did that consistently, we just had a marriage conference this weekend, would that make a difference in a marriage? Would that make a difference in a family? Would it make a difference in a church? In other words, this is what the Apostle Paul says to do. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest but also for the interest of others. So if you want to be a leader, if you want to be successful, he says this is a, a recipe for success to regard others as more important than yourselves. Now as we think in the Bible, if you ask yourself, or I'm going to ask you the question, how do you think Jesus would describe himself? With what attributes would he describe himself? And if you've read the Bible, you might say to yourself, well, well, Jesus is love, and Jesus is loving. And that would certainly be a good answer, but there's no place where he ever said that. Well, and as Charles Swindoll said, well, maybe, maybe you might say Jesus would say, well, I'm grace, because Jesus is certainly gracious, but he never says he's gracious. Not that he isn't, it just doesn't say that. And you might say, well, he'd say, I'm patient. Because there's no one more patient than him. Long-suffering. But he never says that. Even though he is, but he never says that. Well, what, what would he say? What would he say? Well, I know one thing he says in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Listen to what he says. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How does he describe himself? This might be the most clear description of his own person by himself that exists in the Bible. It's almost unique because he doesn't usually talk about himself. And as I think Andrew Murray said, the humble person doesn't think meanly of himself. He doesn't really think of himself at all. And so here, what does Jesus say? He says, I am gentle and humble of heart. Now what does that mean? Those are such important words. If these are the only two words Jesus uses to describe himself, I think it's pretty important. 
Now, one of the dictionaries, Little Kittle, if you want the exact place, talks about the word gentle. And when the word gentle is used, it's used of things. It means um, something that is mild, mild. And when it's used of animals, it's used, uh, it means that they're tame. I've heard people say that in, in, in the horse business, uh, maybe Kyle could verify this, uh, a horse uh, is called a meek horse, means that the horse is obedient. It doesn't mean that it's a softy. I mean, you know, secretariat might be a meek horse because he's under control. He's under the control of the master. He's tamed. That's the idea of the word uh, gentle here. It could also mean of persons, it could mean pleasant. One of the Greek writers says that the opposite of gentle is ferocious uh, or cruel. So if you think of something being cruel, the opposite of that is something being gentle. Uh, you could even maybe use the word, somebody said, the opposite of anger. You could maybe even think of the word benevolent. Most of the times in the Bible, in the King James Bible, it talks about, uses the word meek. Blessed are the meek. New American Standard says, blessed are the gentle. I think the danger sometimes is we think that the word means weak, and it doesn't mean weak. It's almost more like the word good, but, and I'd say benign, but benign almost sounds harmless. It's not harmless. He could be very powerful, but it has the idea of benevolent, good, gracious, uh, mild, tame, under control. These all might be adjectives. So think about Jesus who said, come to me all ye who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for, uh, what does he say here? I am humble and gentle. Gentle and humble. Well, what's the second word there? The second word is, is not gentle, but it's humble. And what does humble mean? Well, humble comes from a word to think of the opposite. Uh, the opposite of humble is high and exalted. Think about in Luke chapter 18. It says, everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. So the word humble has the idea here of, of lowly, but lowly of spirit. Now, when we think about people, we all should be very humble because as Johnny said earlier, we have nothing to say to God. How could we vindicate ourselves when we're guilty? So we should definitely be lowly because we stand guilty. But the mediator has taken the sins away. But think about lowly in that sense there. Low of spirit, humble of spirit. But Jesus, though, is lowly or humble. How is he humble or lowly? Or why would he be? And I think the answer to that is that in his incarnation, he lived in complete dependence upon God. In other words, think about that. Jesus did not even minister in his own power. He ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was completely dependent upon the Father. And so think about it that way. If lowly has a connection to that, then that's how Jesus could be lowly. You and I could be humble or lowly because we should be. In his case, though, he shouldn't be, but he still was because he lived completely in dependence upon the Father. So with those things in mind, and that's how Jesus describes himself, then think about that verse or what we've just looked at here where he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. First Peter 3, Peter in verse 8 says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for insult, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So what does he say here? If you're going to be united, he says, have one mind, and the one mind is, I think, focused on the gospel. You have a great cause. And then what does he say here? He says, don't be selfish, but be humble and regard others as more important than yourselves. That's having the humble mind. So you have the same mind and you have the humble mind. And then in verse 5, he gives us the example. Have this attitude in yourselves. 
Now, literally, what he's saying here is think this way, and it's from the same word of mind. So you could translate it here, have this mind in yourselves. Well, what mind is that? Verse 5, have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ. So now Christ is the great example for the Christian. Have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ. Verse 6, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now when it says form, it's not saying he was like God. He is God. God exists as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He has the exact same nature as God. So he says, who, although he existed in the form of God and did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, what he meant by that is that Jesus didn't hold on to that position in the Godhead. Now, he certainly is God the Son, but what he's talking about as Jesus would become a man, he was willing to relinquish his high position. Now, we're going to use a word here in a minute. Theologians use this big word called the kenosis. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not, but this whole passage is called the kenosis passage, which refers to the emptying of himself. And what does it mean when he emptied himself? <coughs> he humbled himself. What does that mean? Well, the first thing it means is that he did not hold on to that position, who although he existed in the form of God, did not, did not regard equality with God as something that he had to cling to, that he had to hold on to. Then what does the next verse say? but emptied himself. And that's that word kenosis there. Jesus emptied himself. Now does that mean that he no longer was God? Doesn't mean that at all. Does it mean that he sacrificed any of the attributes of deity? Doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that he voluntarily gave up the independent exercise of those attributes that he might live in dependence upon the Father and in the fullness of the Spirit. In other words, he didn't live and walk and operate in his own power on the earth. He humbled himself. What does it say here? He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So part of his emptying himself is that he became a man. Now Jesus has experienced more change than anybody ever has because he's eternally the son, but at a point in time he took upon human flesh. And when he took upon human flesh, he really didn't even operate in the powers that he had, but he operated in the power of the Spirit. Notice that he didn't do miracles until he was the age of 30. Why not? Because he had not yet receive the Spirit. In other words, at the baptism of John, that's where he was anointed with the Spirit. Once he was anointed with the Spirit, he went about and did the deeds that he did and the miracles and the powers in the power of the Spirit. He didn't do it in his own power, but in the power of the Spirit. And he was dependent upon the Father. And he emptied himself and he took the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now there's the ultimate example of gentleness and the ultimate example of lowliness, the ultimate example of humility, and he's our example. And that's what it says there. And we might ask ourselves, well, why did he do that? Well, I think there's several reasons. I think the big picture in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, part of that verse says, And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. In other words, why did he do it? Because there was a joy set before him. What was the joy set before him? That he might redeem a people, that he might purchase a people, that he might pay for their sins, that we might be forgiven. In other words, this was not just uh, an emptying for the sake of emptying, but it was an emptying for the sake of a purpose of purchasing a people. As it says in Matthew 20, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom payment in the place of the many. Why did he do this? To pay the penalty for sins. Why did he do that? Because that was necessary. Why was it necessary? Because all have sinned. Because there's no other way 
Anyone can be forgiven. Now let me ask you this question. I like to ask little theological questions if we were going to have a quiz. If Jesus came to the earth, if he performed every miracle, if he preached every sermon that he did, and then in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before the, the cross, he went back to heaven and didn't go to the cross, then how would people be saved? How would people be forgiven if Jesus never went to the cross? Well, the answer is, they wouldn't be. And they couldn't be. And you say, but wait a second, they could believe in God. Sure, they could believe in God, but what does the Bible say? Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There has to be a payment made. There has to be a penalty payment made. So why did he humble himself? Why did he empty himself? Why did he go to the cross? Because that's the only way anyone could be forgiven. Because without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And you could say, well, let's see. Uh, they could believe in God, but there's no payment for sin. Well, but they could keep the Ten Commandments. But let me ask you that. Has anyone ever kept the Ten Commandments? The Bible says no one has kept the Ten Commandments. Let me ask you, have you kept the Ten Commandments? Of course not. And the Bible says if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. The point is righteousness doesn't come through the law. But as we saw this morning, there's one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom in the place of the all, a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. There's one God and only one mediator. Now that mediator is offered all to come, but he's still the only mediator. But it says if you come, he will in no way cast you out. All that the Father has given me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no way cast out. So then what we're seeing here is he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what are we seeing here this morning? He's saying have the same mind. What are we seeing? He's saying have a humble mind. What are we seeing? He's saying have the mind of Christ Paul in another place says, Who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. How could you and I have the mind of Christ? Because we have the spirit of Christ and we have the word of God. And as, if we, as we submit to the word of God and are filled with the spirit, we can have the mind of Christ, which is a humble mind. And humble doesn't mean weak. And gentle doesn't mean weak. Jesus was powerful. I mean, he went into the temple and he made a scourge of cords and drove the money changers out of the temple and overturned their table and cast them out. And he said, take these things away. And on and on. Certainly doesn't, wasn't weak, but he was gentle and under control and he was benevolent and he was gracious. And that's what he wants for us. There's a verse in Psalm 138. Listen to this. For though the Lord is exalted... It's saying God is over all. Though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly. Now when you think about the word regard, that's an important word. We don't think about regard. We don't use that word too much. But it means he knows and he honors and he esteems. Though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly. Now listen to the next part. But the haughty he knows from afar. Isn't that a great contrast? He says, now God knows all things about everybody. So he's not talking about know about them. God is omniscient. But it says as far as a relationship goes. It says, yet the Lord, he's exalted, yet he regards the lowly. He regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. So think about that when you think about here being united, having the mind of Christ. And the story doesn't end, thankfully, because in verse 9, it says, Therefore God also highly exalted him. Or for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. In other words, the end of the story wasn't the cross. 
Now the cross was the end of sin, but it wasn't the end of the story because it says, therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, what does he say here? That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So those who are in heaven would refer to angels. It would refer to uh, believers in heaven one day. Of those who are in heaven, every knee will bow. And then he says, and on earth, everyone on earth will bow. And under the earth, everyone in hell would bow. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's saying God has exalted his son. The son humbled himself. The son emptied himself. But God the Father exalted him. I like the way it says it in the book of Acts. It says, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Think about the humility of Christ being dependent upon the Father, not working and operating in his own power. And that ultimate faith and trust in the Father was seen in going to the cross because in the cross or on the cross, he gave up his life and he died. But it says, but God raised him up again. In other words, he relinquished his life and yet God the Father raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. How does that apply to you and me? Well, it says that God regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. And think of this verse in 1 Peter 5, 6. Think of this. God exalted Jesus after he humbled himself. In 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. In other words, this message is about here being united in spirit, being over some of these arguments, and I'd say forgiving one another, working together, being united. That could work in a, in a church, it could work in a family, it could work in a marriage, it could work in a workplace, He's saying there's so many, so much bigger things for you being united in the faith of the gospel. That's the big thing. So he says here, be united. And, and how does that work? Well, I think it works by regarding one another, being devoted to one another, giving preference to one another, encouraging one another, building up one another, bearing one another's burdens. Here regarding, regarding one another is more important than yourself. He says, and if you do that, that's an example of humility. And if you do that, what's he say is going to happen? He says, 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. I think that's the word today. What kind of mind do we have? You know, the modern mind, the modern man, what does it say? Stick up for yourselves. You've got to look out for number one. Exalt yourself. Promote yourself. But here I think what he's saying here is be unselfish. And I remember chapter one, the key word is Christ. I think chapter two, the key word is one another or others. And here he's saying prefer one another's, uh, one another, honor one another. And that I think is having the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, what kind of mind do we have? What is our attitude? Can we walk by faith? Jesus walked by such faith in you that he gave up his life, but you raised him up again. Therefore also God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. Lord, we pray that if there's conflicts 
within a church, within this church, within families, within marriages, maybe even at a workplace. We know in, in some of these places, not even everyone's Christian. But as you've said, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Help us, Lord, to think about these principles. Do I have a united mind? Do I have a humble mind? Do I have the mind of Christ? Do I need to forgive? Do I need to encourage? Do I need to edify? Do I need to build up? Lord, we pray we're, we're very weak. We pray that you'd give us strength to do some of these things. We pray your blessing would be upon each one in his or her family. We pray your blessings upon this church, even upon this nation. We think of the scripture that says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would build our houses we pray, each one here, we pray, Lord, help me. Build my life, build my marriage, build my family, build my country. Father, we pray for your blessing. We pray, Lord, if there's one who's never trusted in Christ, help us to see he did the work. It is for us to trust in what he did. We cannot pay for sins but he paid for them all and said, Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, for I will give you rest. What does it mean to come to him? He said in another place, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. It means to believe in him. And Lord, I believe that Jesus is God the Son, and I believe on the cross he paid for my sins, and I trust him as my Savior. Build up your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.